All right, thank you so much for that that cover slide. It's a good representation of the title. The onus is on us. What in the world does that mean? What is an onus? It's not a mythological serpent. In case maybe you were wondering. Well, now you know what it is. If you didn't already. One of those words that you hear from time to time, speaking personally, have an idea of what it means, but I'm not quite sure how you pronounce it. And so I don't use it. But it is onus. Comes from a Latin word meaning burden of proof or burden of proving, literally. If you look it up in the dictionary, it will say something like a difficult or disagreeable responsibility or necessity. A burden or obligation. And then finally, which is what struck me and and the thought I wanted to communicate to you today, the burden of proof. So the onus is on us in terms of the burden of proof. The burden of proof is on us. In other words, we, as Christians, as believers, we have this this weighty responsibility. So, what is the burden of proof that is on us? As Christians, as believers, is there... Is there a burden of proof? And I am asserting to you today that there is. And I will attempt to show from Scripture, not just my opinion, but from Scripture, that there is such a thing. And so the the onus is on me to show that the onus is on us. Are you thoroughly confused? I hope not. I would take us back to John 17 to begin our time of study this morning. We've been looking at this chapter a fair bit the last couple months. And verse 21, as part of Jesus' prayer for for us, for all his believers, not just his immediate disciples, but those who would come to believe, that is us, he prays that all of them may be what? One, Father, just as you are in me and I am in them, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And then verse 23, a similar thought that he conveys. I in them, you in me, so that they may be brought to complete, what? Complete unity. Repeats the thought. Oneness, unity, same thing. Then, then the world will, what? Know that you sent me and have loved them, that is us, even as you have loved me. So we see here, it's is quite clear that our oneness, our unity, how we relate to one another is a proof, a piece of evidence to the world, to the unbeliever about who Jesus is. And as it says in, I think it was verse 21, It can even lead to belief. 
But at the least, verse 23 said, at least they will know that you sent me. So it seems to indicate people may not believe, come to faith, but at least they will know. And then Matthew 5, I'd like to couple John 17 with Matthew 5, another familiar scripture to us. Verse 14, the first part of it, Jesus says simply, you, speaking to his followers, you are the light of the world. And then verse 16 He follows up and says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may, what? See your good works and see what a good person you are. Doesn't say that, does it? That they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So Jesus is saying that we are salt and light. And how we live our lives, our good deeds, our actions, our behavior can be so supernatural that people will see them and glorify God. That they'll come to faith in God as a result of witnessing how we live our lives. One of the good things, (laughs) one of the good things about Facebook, you get all these different things from people. And not all of them are good. Some of them are good, okay? I want to share with you, you probably can't read that, but I'll, I'll, sh- I'll share it with you. There's a uh, little cartoon that, that somebody has created called Coffee with Jesus. Though I'm pretty sure Jesus drinks chamomile tea. But it's called Coffee with Jesus. And it's just a frame of four cartoons or four frames, conversations with Jesus is really what it's all about. Women, men, pastors, even Satan, they have conversing with Jesus. Very interesting. This one came up recently, and I I thought it made an excellent point, and I'd like to share it and then speak to it just a little bit. The first frame, uh, Kevin is his name. Kevin is speaking to Jesus, and he says, When I was into New Age, or Buddhism, or Kabbalah, or whatever, people were so accepting and cool with my search, Jesus. But now, and Jesus says, Kevin, I'm not cool. I'm the end of the search. That tends to make people uncomfortable. And Kevin responds, it's like anything, but Jesus is cool, Jesus. And Jesus says, and I'm cool with that, Kevin. And I thought about that. And on one level, which I think the the person is trying to communicate, is very true. Jesus is a nuisance. Jesus is exclusive. Jesus is demanding. And he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. People don't like to hear that. The cross is still a a stumbling block. The cross is still foolishness. So on that level, I agree. It's very, very true. It's an excellent point. You can talk about all kinds of spiritual 
avenues that you're traveling and people will think, oh, that's just wonderful. And then you find Jesus and all of a sudden, ah, we're not so sure. But then as I thought about this, I thought that it was also true on another level. Where Jesus isn't cool. And part of that is on us. In that, people have not been given the evidence they deserve. There is a lack of proof for who Jesus really is and what He's come to do. Often Christians, and I'm thinking of the wider, greater Christian community, often we have given unbelievers a fragmented, imperfect picture that is inaccurate. It's not compelling, it's not persuasive, and it's not cool. Because it doesn't, it doesn't go along with Scripture. It's like the quote I have from Brendan Manning, who sums it up beautifully, this point here. Notice what he says. The greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny Him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. It's true. It's true. So, if they are finding our our message, our truth, unbelievable, it seems as if we should examine ourselves and ask, what's the evidence that we're giving? What's the evidence I'm giving? Is it good evidence? Is it compelling? Is it true? You know, are we making a good case for people to believe in Jesus? It seems like too often the world unbelievers are saying, I'm just not seeing it. Prove it. Prove it. Give me some evidence. The onus is on us. Now, we are likely, or it might come to our mind right now, to make an excuse or to say something like, don't look at me. Don't look at us. I'm not perfect. The church isn't perfect. Look at Jesus. You've heard that, haven't you? But you know... Jesus won't let us say that. He will not allow that. Jesus says, no, look at them, my followers. You are the light of the world. Your unity, your oneness, your love is to be a witness that I've come. Jesus will not defend us there. He will not excuse us. He says, that's what I've called you for. So Jesus puts the onus on us, the burden of proof. And He says, you, we, together, you are to give evidence of the truth of who I am. And part of this, a big part, we're called to do more than simply believe. Now, we're good at believing, aren't we? 
We are. We are good at believing. But we're called to do more than simply believe. To do more than simply, you know, mentally accept the truth, the message, the Scripture. We must also live it out. We must live it out. We must give evidence. We must demonstrate it. We must prove it by our lives. Our scripture reading from James 2 is, is just so, so appropriate. And I want to change it up just a little bit. I want to try to make it relevant. And I hope I don't make it too relevant. <laughs> uh, yes, let's see where that goes. Uh, verse 14, James 2. He says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but no deeds? Can, can, can such a faith save them? Okay, verse 15. Here, I'm going to switch it up a little bit. Suppose a brother or sister is without a country. They have been bombed out of their country. And one of you says to them, I sure hope you can find a place to live in, but does nothing to help them. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by deeds, is dead. James is saying, make it real. Do something. Likely, probably, all of us would say, you know, I believe the Bible. Do you really? Are you going to obey the Bible? You might believe it. Are you going to obey it? Are you going to do it? Most of us would say, yes, I believe the Bible. But then the, the unbeliever looks at us and says, hmm, that's interesting that you say that. Because to me, it seems like so many of you Christians, you just, you know, you pick and choose what you like in the Bible and you aren't really consistent. Okay, I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a few minutes. I'm going to come at you from the, the viewpoint of the unbeliever. Give you another example I hope is relevant. Forgive me if I happen to be tiptoeing on politics. That's not my intent. Again, I'm coming at it from the viewpoint of the unbeliever, how they view Christians. There's a text in Leviticus 19, verses 33 and 34. It says, When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. In fact, verse 34, the foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself. This is in the Bible. For you, notice his, his, his reasoning behind this, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now, a lot of Christians stumble over this. And they say, oh, i got to be careful because it may not be safe to have foreigners come here. So when did Jesus ever say, follow me as long as it's safe? He doesn't, does he? He doesn't. And then I think of 
there's some other verses in, in Leviticus 19 that, that we like better. Okay? Uh, verse 3, I don't think I have these up there, but just share them with you. Verse 3, same chapter, 19. Each of you must respect your mother and father. Good with that, aren't we? You must observe my Sabbaths. We're good with that. I am the Lord your God. Verse 11, don't lie, don't steal, don't deceive one another. We're good with those. But these foreigners, not so sure about them. Same chapter. And then I go back to, I don't know why this came to mind, but it did. Leviticus 11, because we like Leviticus 11, don't we? You know what's there? Talks about clean and unclean animals. And we say, that's important to us. What you eat or don't eat. But unclean people, aliens and strangers, not so much. And so, unbelievers look at us, that kind of thinking, those kinds of practices, and they say, I see people more concerned about what they're eating than the treatment that aliens are receiving. You going to believe in a God like that? No, Jesus is not cool. If that's Jesus, then he's not cool. People more concerned about what's going in them than what is coming out. And too often they respond, we're not buying that. We're not buying that. And you know, I don't think God is either. In fact, you probably recall Jesus in the book of Mark said, what comes out? You know, your actions, your behavior are more important than what you eat. So the world wants some good evidence. Some good evidence. And God says to us, give them some evidence. Give them something they can go on, something they can build on, something they can hold to. You are the evidence I have chosen to show the world. The onus is on us. So we can say, we can say, you and I can say, this is God's Word. And the unbeliever says, prove it. We can say, Jesus is the Christ. He's the Lord and Savior of the world. And they say, give me some evidence. This is the way. This is the way to see the world. This is reality. And they say, prove it. Give me some evidence. They challenge us. Show us your oneness. Show us your unity. Prove your faith, your belief in God's Word by actions. We need more than words. We need, they say, we need to see it. We need to see it. Or we won't believe. And that's not an unreasonable request. That, that demand, that request is okay. The unbelieving world is like doubting Thomas. Remember what Thomas said? We do, don't we? He said, unless I see Jesus with my own eyes, touch Him, 
with my own hands, I'm not going to believe. Jesus met him where he was, didn't he? Yes, Jesus appeared to him. He gave him evidence. And unbelievers today, they are crying out, Let me see. Give me a sign that Christ really lives. Don't, don't tell me what you believe. Show me. The onus is on us to give evidence, to give proof to that which we believe. In the book of John, the Gospel of John, we find seven signs that Jesus gives. Now, I want to comment on just two of those. The first one, John chapter 2, is when he turned the water into wine. We all remember that. It was his first, well, as it says there in verse, verse 11. His first miracle, his first sign, and it says after he performed that miracle, that sign, it says his disciples what? They believed in Him. They put their trust in Him as a result of that revelation or sign. The second one is when He healed an official son who came to Jesus and said, My son is sick. He's going to die. Just speak the word. And, and Jesus did that. He was healed. And as a result, and this was the, the second sign it says the last part of that verse there it says so he and his whole household believed because of the sign the miracle that Jesus performed now unfortunately going on with the rest of the signs not everyone believed neither in the signs or in Jesus. In fact, we find that the signs divided the people. They became a point of separation. But they still were given the signs. They were given the evidence. They were shown the miracles. And they were forced and had to decide, do I believe or do I not? Today, we are called to give a sign. You and I are called to be a miracle to our unbelieving neighborhood. To, to manifest this, this miracle of unity. To demonstrate love for one another. And truth in, in such a compelling way that people are at least forced to make a decision. And it must be real. It must be more than just a concept. We must live it out. We must demonstrate it. As with Jesus in the Gospel of John... If we give such a sign, if we actualize the miracle, it doesn't mean everyone who sees and witnesses it is going to believe. They didn't in Jesus' day. Many turned away. But if we don't give them evidence, they are not going to believe. They won't have any reason to even consider the claims of Christ. And if they turn away, if they turn away, if they choose not to believe in Christ that we proclaim by word and actions, 
let's be sure that our lives, our church fellowship, our message is so close to what Jesus wants for us. So that if they turn away, what they are turning away from is not some fragmented, imperfect, hypocritical picture that God Himself does not endorse. But let's be sure that if they turn away, they are turning away from a clear, genuine message of who Jesus really is. My challenge, my appeal today comes from two unbelievers. The first I shared with you a few weeks ago from George Bernard Shaw, the the great English playwright. He was a skeptic when it came to religious matters. And he was once asked what he thought of Christianity. And he replied... It might work if they tried it. In other words, show me. Give me some evidence. It's a beautiful theory. It's a beautiful concept. Could you try it? Could you live it out? And then the other, Friedrich Nietzsche, raised in a religious home, became one of the great atheists of all time, railing against the teachings of Jesus. He issued this challenge. If you want me to believe in your Redeemer, you are going to have to look a lot more redeemed. This is a challenge that unbelievers are giving us today. If you want us to believe in your Redeemer, you're going to have to look a lot more redeemed. Fortunately, time has not yet run its course. The unbelieving world is still looking for a sign, a reason to believe. The onus is on us.